Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. You are in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza, and really excited about our guest today. Uh, we're actually going to talk about Kobe, Bre- uh, Kobe Bryant to be topical. We're going to talk about uh, why his death, what does it tell us about heroes? Uh, is there a hero archetype? Why has he, why did his premature death impact us so much? And why do athletes always be look, or why do we always look up to athletes as heroes? Those are just some of the questions we're going to get from our guest. He is uh, Dr. Andrew Bernstein, and he is the author of his latest published book, which is Heroes, Legends, and Champions, Why Heroism Matters. We're going to talk about what heroes are, how they are distinguished from non-heroes, and why mankind needs them. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Andrew to the podcast. Hamza, so it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Before we get started, I do have to ask you, if you watch basketball, and if you do, did you see the game last night between LeBron and Zion Williamson? No, no. I, I mean, I love basketball, but I didn't see the game. And I, we know LeBron's a stud, has been for a long time. And Zion is just, he's off the charts, man. If that kid can stay healthy, he's going to rewrite the record book in the NBA. He is really something. So what happened? Absolutely. Well, no, it, it was kind of like, we're, I guess we're going to talk about in this podcast about the hero archetype, because like you said, he, he, he has so much potential, Zion does, at 19 years old. Right. And there was some of that, like, is it going to be a passing of the guard? And so LeBron hadn't scored 40 points in a very long time, but he did last night. And it was kind of like, you're going to have your day, uh, Zion, but just not today. The king is not yet ready to abdicate. That is <laughs> That's exactly what happened last night. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Lakers may play for the title this year. I doubt the Pelicans will. So, you know, uh, Zion's day is going to have to wait as far as uh, winning championships goes. Absolutely. And so since you are a basketball fan, let, uh, I want to talk about the untimely, um, unfortunate events of everything that happened because I remembered uh, the night before, there I'm from New Jersey, so I'm from South Jersey, so you know, fly Eagles fly and Sixers and all that good stuff. Right. And so a lot of uh, there were a lot of us, a lot of friends. We were watching uh, the Sixers play the Lakers because LeBron was going to pass Kobe, and that was supposed to be such the big news, you know. And then the next day, what everyone else is talking about. And so prior to this premature death, there was a making of, oh, this guy's going to be the top three. He's the third most scoring uh, player in the NBA, LeBron. And um, it just was not in his belt for being a hero. Yeah, well, LeBron, LeBron certainly is. I, you know, uh, and I think it's interesting how – Athletes are often looked up to as heroes, and, and, and I think legitimately so. And, and you know, I, I think that raises the prior question of, well, what makes somebody a hero, and, and how is it that athletes qualify? And, um, so, so anyway, that's what my book, you know, the main question in the book is, well, what makes someone a hero? And I think, I think there are four, you know, you know, Hamza, in the 19th century, there was a lively debate on, on heroes. It was called the Great Man Theory of History back then. You know, there's a lot of top-rate people, I mean, including Frederick Nietzsche, who, you know, who weighed in on this question. But nobody ever defined it. No, you know, nobody ever defined what a hero is. And that's one of the things I tried to do in my book. But I think the, the most you know, prominent characteristics here, you know, heroes, I think, take act. You know, that, that kind of epic heroes that I was discussing in my book. I started with people like, you know, Maria Montessori and George Washington Carver and Ernest Shackleton and you know, people like that, um, you, you know, who, who, who achieve these grand scale accomplishments. I think, one, they take service in, in uh, they take action in service of human life. You know, they promote uh, human well-being. Right? You know, they're, they're heroes, not villains. You know, they're, they're uh, promoting life, not destroying it. I think two, they, they, these great heroes have a certain degree of, of prowess, you know, of ability. Whether they're, whether they're smarter than everybody else, or they're, they're stronger, or, or whatever it is, uh, they have they have this great level of ability. And three, 
the kind of courage or your dauntlessness that it takes to face severe obstacles and even you know even death uh you know to 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 reach their goals and I, and four I think heroes uh achieve victory in at least a moral sense you know they inspire us even if they by their 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 uprightness by their greatness even if they fail to achieve victory in a in a practical sense so I think this is what you know, makes uh, uh, people heroes, and and I think there are you know there have been a lot of a lot of great heroes historically, and and unfortunately, um, I, we're in an anti-hero mentality. They uh, in a culture though heroes aren't as mired as 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 much as they were in the past, and I think the one exception to that is the arena of sports, where in sports uh, you're allowed to be great. I mean, even in sports, I mean, there, there are the haters, right? There, there people always say, you know, haters got to hate, you know, and stuff like mm-hmm. that. But I think in, I think in sports, uh, people are allowed to be great without as much negative criticism of them as, as there are in, in other areas, which is, which, is, which is an interesting phenomenon, you know, if I'm right about that. Yeah, and, and I, I'm sure we're going to spend a lot of time on sports, and I would like to put a pin into it. And the reason why is on andrewbernstein.net, where you're talking about the hero archetype, and we're talking about the arena of sports. But outside the sports, um, you know, it's kind of interesting that we can kind of look back and make this ass- assertion. But in, on your on your website, in the first paragraph, there were a time where – Adolf Hitler was considered a hero, and so was uh, Stalin or Osama bin Laden to their people when you said, you know, a degree of prowess, facing severe obstacles uh, in, in in, in the short term, a moral sense. And so, you know, how do you exclude them? And do you exclude them from the grand scheme because we know their full picture? And what's the danger of also identifying someone like that in current times? Yeah, that's a good that's a good point, Hamza. Because it's 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 crucially important to identify the right people as heroes. Otherwise, you know, you, meant, you know you you pointed out from the introduction to my book, Hitler, Stalin, Osama bin Laden. Uh, you, you know, these guys are uh, terrible mass murderers. I don't know how many you know Hitler and Stalin between them. I don't know how many millions of innocent civilians they were responsible for for murdering. So I think. You know, if one of the, the salient characteristics of heroism is action in promotion of human life, then I think we can, and I think, and I, and I do stand by that, I think that's important, um, we can definitively exclude mass murderers, you know, from, from the echelon of heroes. <laughs> and it's not even like after the fact. You know, the Nazis are fighting race war. They claim, you know, they're the superior race, and they have the they have the moral authority to enslave and or annihilate the so-called inferior races. So they're actually preaching, you know, mass murder before they even perpetrate it. Communists are mm-hmm. fighting class war. Uh, Osama bin Laden is fighting holy war, and they all believe that they have, you know, they have the moral authority to to murder, you know, innocent people. And um, I think I think we can definitively exclude them from the category of heroes, you know, you know, based on this. And I think we I think we absolutely need to, uh, and they have to, to wreak the kind of havoc they did in real in real life. They need followers and and, and a lot of followers, and you know, and, mm-hmm. and people you know. Not, not not blindly probably, but irrationally follow these these guys. Whereas on the other hand, if you look at like some of the people I mentioned, you know, like. Uh, I, 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 I'm a big fan of George Washington Carver, and, and George Washington, too, for that matter. But we, we, we can get to But Carver, I mean, his biographer, Lawrence Elliott, you know, the title of the book is George Washington Carver, The Man Who Overcame. And it's unbelievable and really inspiring. To, you, you read his, his biography, the things he overcame to get the education that he got. And, and then, of course, at Tuskegee Institute, he, he was able to revolutionize agricultural science and and he's a great pioneer in that field, and you know, in crop rotation, and able to grow more crops, you know, have more food, feed more people. Uh, but what he overcame to get an education is extraordinary, and uh, and and in service of positive goals, you know, of of agricultural science. And similarly, you know, one of the other heroes I discussed, and we want to know, we'll see that women, you know, can do these great things too. Maria Montessori revolutionized, you know, child's education and really focused on educating the mind, which is really important in the United States today, given the, the, the sorry state of our educational system. And she had to deal with the fascist regime in Italy and, you know, and had, had to, you know, leave her homeland and stuff. And these are people who really, you know, 
took action that advanced human life, childhood education, agricultural science. You know, they're not, they're not advocating or acting on, on you know, mass murders. So I think, I think it's really important to, to, rec- to get the right heroes, the people who make human life better, not the ones who make it worse. Uh, absolutely. And, and the reason why I, I do want to stand for one second, and uh, uh, pardon me about not knowing that. I do know that Stalin was a murderer and what have you, but until the time, I'm just thinking from a historical standpoint that there was a time in 1938 where Hitler was named Man of the Year and Osama was fighting the Russians. That's what made us support him at the time. So initially, I mean, uh, ultimately they became the you know monsters that we're talking about that that mark on on history but that's why i was trying to determine like it how do do we have the foresight to see someone that has or on the surface has so much potential to go in the right direction but they don't and become like the total opposite that we're talking about well you know i you know again it's an interesting point and i think uh, we, with, with people generally, and certainly with powerful political leaders, whether they're, you know, the 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 head, the, you know, the head of state in Germany or Russia or whatever, I think we need to take people at their word. And you know, you know, when Hitler planned, his, I mean, his book Mein Kampf was published in the 1920s, as as I recall, you know, years before he came to power in 1933, and um, mm. you know. He outlined the plan, you know, the, uh, you know, the Ari and racial superiority and, and, and world conquest and uh, at the very least enslavement of the inferior races. I don't know if they, I don't remember if he t- talked yet about annihilation of them, but at the very least, you know, an enslavement of the so-called inferior races. And uh, Stalin, the same, you know, in the Soviet Union, the communists, they know, you know, they, they're very open about fighting class warfare and, and, and wiping out the owning class. You know, so I think we need you know, people. Hitler yeah, was a buffoon in a way, you know, so people laughed at him. They didn't take him seriously. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a fatal mistake. You know, whether somebody buff- you know, uh, has buffoon characteristics or not, when, they, when they're planning world conquest and mass murder, you need to sit up and listen and, and take notice. And some people did. You know, Churchill was an early uh, uh, a person who opposed Hitler and warned the British you know, of, of, to take him seriously and his dangers. I think we need to take people at their word when they tell us, you know, what kind of, you know, destruction they intend to, you know, in, impose on the world. Sure, sure. It's funny that you said uh, he was seen as a buffoon, uh, because if we go to current times, uh, there's a leader of the first world in some circles that would have been considered that, but is seen as the hero on another side. Like, I mean, there's people, I mean, you have definitely a, uh, uh, a character that people are leaning on both ends of the spectrum and it's okay how do we determine in the school of history if we look back you know it's 2030 2040 2050 if we look back to this time do we say oh well all the writing was on the wall is it, and is it easier to do that because of all the technology where uh, of, uh, it was harder back in like you said the 20s and 1920s 1930s yeah i i mean I, in the 19 19- 20s and 30s it wasn't even television then you know never mind you know international satellite hookups i mean today it's today it's nothing you know the the olympics is the the 2016 olympics were in rio as i recall uh yep. 2012 uh, in london you know i remember you know 2008 in beijing when uh uh, it was 2000, yeah, when, when Michael Phelps won like 20, you know, gold medals or some ridiculous thing. You know, sitting at home, watching the TV, and this thing, this, this, uh, these events are unfolding in Beijing all the way around the world. And it's like nothing. We, I mean, we take it for granted. 1920s, I mean, there's no TV at all. And radio, you know, radio was a, a relatively new uh, device. So, you know, it was very hard in the United States, let's say, or even in Britain. To, to know what Hitler was, was doing or, or, or saying. There's no social media, obviously, no, you know, no personal computers, Internet, social media. So, yeah, it's much easier today to keep tabs on, you know, you know, on, on people who might be really dangerous. Kim Jong-un comes to mind. Again, yeah, he's got buffoon characteristics, too. But mm-hmm. he's, also, he's also a brutal dictator armed with nuclear weapons. So, you know... Uh, He's a dangerous dude, and uh, and and to see the president of the United States, in this case, you know, uh, Donald Trump, sort of c- 
conducting a bromance with him is it was was, was, right. was kind of was kind of disturbing. But uh, he's a dangerous he's a dangerous guy, and uh, Trump was more accurate when he called him Rocket Man, you know, mm. uh, pointing, out the da- <laughs> pointing out the dangers of this guy than he was when he kind of met with him. And then I mean, my jaw hit the floor when uh, you know when President Trump left. The meeting and said the North Korean people love Kim Jong Un. I mean, it's like this, that's disgraceful. There's, they they have legalized slavery in that country. There's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of people p- performing brutal slave labor, including little kids. And I don't think you know those people or their family members love Kim Jong Un. It's a disgrace for the leader of the uh, of the United States to say such a thing. So, with, with that being said, is it easier to make or name? or I rally behind an athlete because they're on a finite prism, if you will, and we don't really, even though we know more about their personal lives, it's easier to kind of, oh, well, that's okay because he can still score touchdowns or throw a pass or slam dunk or, you know, score uh, hit a home run. Is it easier to identify with sports sportsmen for that reason? Yeah, you know, that's an interesting point. You reminded me of what, the great Charles Barkley who uh, – was not just a great player, but he speaks his mind. There's one thing, you know, whether, mm-hmm. I, whether I agree with, with Barkley or, or on, on a given issue or don't agree with him, he doesn't kiss up to the politically correct establishment. He speaks his mind, and, you know, and, I, and I have a lot of respect for him for that. And I remember, he, I remember him getting in hot water once when he said something like, you know, athletes shouldn't be role models. Parents, mm-hmm. you know, should be role models. He said, why should somebody... You know, be a role model just because he can dunk a basketball. He, you know, he said, "I know, you know, drug dealers in schoolyards who can do that." You know, mm-hmm. that's a good point. Uh, nevertheless, you know, having having said that, I think the great thing about sports and why so many of us love it is, um, uh, in, on the playing field, it's it's tremendous talent and dedication to a goal. You know, you know how and Kobe's a good example, and I and I sure and I hope and I was never a Laker fan, by the way. I mean, I mean to me, Michael Jordan is the goat. You know, I mean, he's, mm-hmm. he's the guy I love mm-hmm. you more than anybody. But I respect Kobe. He's no argument. Player. Yeah, right. <laughs> no yeah. argument there. <laughs> right, right. But I respect Kobe. He's a great player. I I certainly hope he was innocent of that rape allegation. You know, the char- the charges were dropped. I think only two people, you know, will ever know what actually happened. You know, Kobe and the lady involved, and of course he he's gone now. So I certainly hope he's innocent of that, but we don't know. Uh, but leaving that aside, holding that in abeyance, you know, on the plane on the playing field, you know, on the basketball court, mm-hmm. it's not just his great talent. Like in fact, like MJ, I think we can compare him to the goat in this way. Mm-hmm. He combined a tremendous work ethic with. You know, tremendous natural talent, and that you know that's what made Michael Jordan the greatest of all time, and it's what made it's what made Kobe an all time great. We, and so we have tremendous respect for his work ethic, and you know, in Aristotle's terms, he actualized his potential. He's as good as he, as great as he could be, and then the will to win. You know, the you, 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 the overcoming obstacles. You're playing the best in the world. Those last two titles. You know, well, one long after Shaq was gone, it was Kobe was the guy. He put the team on his back and carried them to the title. And so, watching some great person like that, who's great at what he does, he's great because of natural talent, but also because of the work ethic. Playing against the best in the world, you know, for an, uh, an important goal in, within the sports world, you know, carrying a team on his back to victory, it's enormously inspiring, and you know, can inspire us to to work as hard. Maybe we don't have Kobe's talent in whatever field we're in, but we have some degree of talent. What if we had his work ethic and his dedication, you know, to, to perfect himself? I mean, how far or how high might we go? It's very inspiring. And so that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I love sports, and I'm glad that uh, sports heroes are, are allowed to be heroes without being hated as much as, you know, people who are in other fields. Oh, Absolutely. And I, I like to put a, a nice bow, if you will, in that when at his funeral the other day, Michael Jordan spoke on his behalf. Right. And so it was. You saw that um, it was an appreciation, and, and if you didn't see it, it was more of a you know he was like a little brother to him, and but he emulated him, he mirrored him to such extent that it was like you had to acknowledge him and like you just said the tremendous work ethic and all so it, it was kind of it, it seemed like that was the, the picture that was being painted last night as well as far as th- if we have a timeline and we have a perfect picture you know the we have what's called passing the baton so you right. have 
Jordan, you have uh, you have Kobe, and then you have LeBron, and then maybe Zion or something like that. So from like a old school Howard Cosell moment, this is how it would be, and this is the lineage of heroes that we can follow and emulate. Yeah, I mean that's uh, that's true, and and um, if anybody who's a basketball fan, I, I think we we should uh, appreciate the NBA is in a golden age right now. There's so much talent in the league. I mean, I mean, George just drops at some of these guys, you know, uh, the Greek freak, and they're on different teams too, you know, the Greek freaks are tremendous talent, Zion, is trying, Anthony Davis, you know, with the Lakers, what's that kid from Croatia in Dallas, I forget his name. Oh, yeah, 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 I yeah, forget his uh, name, but I know who you're talking about. Luca, Luca something, um, but he's a tremendous offensive player, you know, and the, it's mm-hmm. all over, all over the league, there's just, there's, there's this, there's a tremendous amount of uh, tremendous amount of talent, and uh, you know, and, and, and the guys in, in, with the Sixers, you know, uh, and Bead, Joel Embiid, and 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 ben, and Ben Simmons. There's a tremendous amount of talent in the NBA. It's it, this is this is like the '80s, you know, in in a way when we had Magic, we had Bird, and we had uh, MJ, you know, and and this is this is this is great basketball, and some of these guys. Uh, you know, you know the, the, to, to get to that level, I think I think this is why we look up to athletes as heroes. Um, we know that to get to that level, you need more than great talent. You need to really work at it. There's tremendous work ethic that goes into being, you know, an NBA. Or, or, oh, by the way, I got to mention one of my all-time favorite players is Russell Westbrook. I mean, the dude that mm-hmm. let us is just extraordinary. <laughs> I go watch. I mean, when he when he averaged a triple double three years in a row. Was something yes. insane like that? He's just a, and he averaged a triple double that that one year. He was the MVP when on a, he averaged you know uh, ten assists or more a game on a team that couldn't shoot. I mean, how many assists would he have had if the team had any shooters? You know, <laughs> but but the mm-hmm. work ethic that goes. I mean, Russell Westbrook's an extraordinary athlete, but I mean, you can't do what he does. You know, an NBA Hall of Fame level career without working really, really, really hard at it. And I think that's why. Even though you know, you know I'm a big uh, you know Yankee fan in, in baseball, and even though I think a lot of fans you know the baseball players make an insane amount of money, uh, but you know all around professional sports they make a lot of money. And so I think this is why a lot of fans we might be struggling to make a living, but the, for the most part we don't begrudge them making tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars a year because we know how much work they put into their into their craft. You know uh, how, how they got to be that how they got to be that good and watching them play at that level inspires us to try and be the best we can be. So that's why I, I think sports heroes are legitimate heroes to me. Oh, absolutely. And, and I, I like what you said. I'm going to remember that about NBA being, being the golden age, because when, you know, there's a, when you get into arguments with your friends and they're like, who's the best or for basketball, is it Kobe, is it Jordan? And, but they would ask Jordan who he thought was the best. And he would say, Dr. J. And so it was always like that passing the baton um, to the ones before you. But when you said NBA being the golden age today, 10 years from now, what kind of argument can you have? You can't have it for one person just for all the people you just mentioned. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's great. Oh, I, you know, and there's, there's 20 others. I mean, Steph Curry, I mean, he's injured now, but, I mean, he, like, revolutionized the game. I mean, you know, it was very inspiring to watch. I mean, I remember when he was a skinny kid at, uh, at uh, Davidson, and he, and he mm-hmm. came into the Madison Square Garden, you know, in the tournament in, in, in March, March Madison, mm-hmm. and just shot the lights out and, you know, and made a name for himself. Uh, you know, he's inspiring because very often, you know, you got ten guys on the court at one time. He he may he may be one the smallest dude on the court at any given moment, but two, he's also very often the best player on the court. And so it showed right. that you know, I mean, he was six three. It's not like he it's not like he was five eight, but still, relatively small guys can excel. You know, in the NBA when they're as skilled as as Steph Curry. So you know, there's, and 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 then you know his former teammate. You know, Durantula, as they called him, you know, Kevin Durant. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a great, great, great player. That's a, oh, it's really, really sad he's out for the year, but, you know, we'll see if he comes back at 100%. But the gold, I think, the, I, think, I think you can make a very strong case the NBA is in a golden age. There's great talent dispersed throughout the league. It's very competitive. And, and LeBron's not ready to abdicate, like, like we said before. He's still a tremendous player. James Harden's a tremendous player. The league is just loaded with talent. It's great, it's great fun. Uh, absolutely. 
and, and you just touched on my favorite time of year. And as you were talking about uh, heroes in, in history, you had the Coliseum where, you know, there would be droves of people to watch. And it was, kind of, you know, even the Bible, the David versus Goliath. And so it reminds me of March Madness, You right? You have the Cinderella's. That's like you yeah. went to what school? And you're right. playing against Duke and North Carolina, whatever, or they get kicked out of the first round. How much do you see – it, uh, each year a hero being born during March Madness or do you see like uh, do you see any of these uh, pe- uh, pictures or uh, stories of uh, fairy tale stories being generated through college as they progress the uh, pro ball yeah I mean I mean it's it's that's what makes the tournament so great, you know, and, and, and the postseason in any sport is, is great, you know, because you could dominate the regular season. And if you do, chances are you're the best team. You know, like in, 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 in baseball, they say 162-game season doesn't lie. And, you know, and, it, and it's similar, you know, in the NBA, you have an 82-game season. It, it doesn't lie. And, it, you know, if, if, you, if, if you play 30 games in college basketball, and, and you and you go twenty nine and one or something, and nobody's been undefeated in a long time. Oh, right? well, uh, well, Kentucky came into the tournament undefeated about five years ago, didn't they? And they got knocked. Yeah, off. with uh, the brow, the unibrow. That's yeah, what uh, yeah, Anthony yeah. Davis was on. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. That was the first time somebody came into the tournament undefeated, I think, in years. And mm-hmm. I certainly thought they were going to win the championship, but but yeah, that's what makes the postseason so exciting. That you know you could go, you could be sixteen and zero in the regular season like the Patriots were, but you still you know the postseason is a whole other season, and, and I have no mm-hmm. doubt they were better than the ten and six Giants. But you know, for one game or a short series, you know uh, the, the 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 weaker team can knock you off, and that's what makes the yeah. March Madness. You know that, that's what lends to the madness. Yeah, you might you might have gone thirty, you know, in the regular season. But it's a whole nother season. Now now the money's on the table. Now you really and if you come in as the best team with the best record, the pressure's on you. And can you do it again? Can, that's the mark of a real champion. Can you win when everybody expects you to win, when all the pressure is on you to win? Then you, then you, then you have a, you know, a real champion. That's part of the excitement of the postseason in, in any sport. When you said, you know, the, we saw what happened with the Warriors a few years ago. I mean, what were they? They were 73-9 and nine or something? Yeah, when, yeah. When they got upset by LeBron and, uh, and Kyrie. And there's another great player. You know, uh, Kyrie, when he's healthy, he's a tremendous offensive player. Um, yeah, they got upset. I, I you know that's they were a much better team, no question. The regular season doesn't lie, but in the postseason, short series, anything can happen. That's you know. So mm-hmm. so yeah, you got these Cinderellas. They can come out of nowhere, and, and all of a sudden, you, you these these guys can make a big name for themselves and and be a hero. It's very exciting to watch the uh, postseason in any sport that you love. Uh, absolutely, and since it is February, I'm gonna play nice because you, you made the little uh, acknowledgement to the Giants, so it sounds like there's some favoritism there. It, but I appreciate how you were saying that how they overcame the – or how they beat the, the Patriots. And we were kind of, you know, down the road here. Uh, we felt the same way when the Eagles beat the Patriots in the Super Bowl. So my question is, when we identify heroes – why does it always seem that they we only let them up to a certain level? Like we build them up to tear them down. Like, oh, you ha- you're not better until you beat you beat the Patriots, or you're not better until you beat Duke, or you're not better until you beat Golden State for many years. Why is that the case instead of just relishing the fact that these guys are champions? Yeah, I I know this this um, and by the way the uh, when the Eagles. Uh, beat the Patriots. The Patriots didn't come undefeated. That's why I mentioned the the Giants. You know that time mm-hmm. the the you know, that first. I'm not even a Giants fan to tell you the truth, but uh, the the Patriots were undefeated that first time the Giants beat them. That was that was you know a huge upset. I certainly thought the mm-hmm. Patriots would win, but uh, yeah. Well, they, what do they say? You know, to 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 be the best, you you got to beat the best, and and uh, you know, mm-hmm. I think. The, even in sports, although maybe less so than in business or politics, or but uh, even in sports, there's a there's um there's this there's just this rotten kind of envy that 
you know, that a lot of people feel that, that you, you can't be too successful, you know, because then, mm-hmm. then you, I remember a friend of mine was uh, going out with a woman, you know, in, in the 90s. She, she, she was a big Michael Jordan fan. You know, you, uh, you know it's, people don't remember today unless they, unless they were, you know, of, of a certain age. But when MJ came into the league in 84, there were seven long years when, you know, before the Bulls won a title. And everybody, you know, all the pundits, everybody, oh, you know, yeah, he's a great player, but he doesn't make the guys around him better. You know, he's not going to win a championship. He's not Larry Bird. He's not Magic Johnson. He can't make the players around him better. And, I mean, mm. that, I mean MJ was put down all the time, and that, and that fueled him. It drove him. He, he's such a competitive guy. And so she was a big mm. fan of Michael Jordan, you know, maybe even after the first championship in 91. But after the Bulls started rattling off championships, she stopped rooting for him, and she said explicitly he wins too much. And I was like, mm. my, jaw, my jaw dropped. I mean, when I heard this, I mean, I mean, do you know how hard that is? I mean, it's hard to win one title. But once you have one, you're the champs. The bullseye is right on your chest or on your back, as it should be. You're the champs. Yeah. Everybody's going to knock you off. It's much harder to repeat. Never mind three-peat. Never mind do a double three-peat. <laughs> you know, it's like extraordinary you know, what Mike, Michael Jordan accomplished with the Bulls. And even in sports, there's this kind of envy that you can't, you can't get to be too good. Or otherwise, people are going to, they're going to hate on you. you know? And, it's, and it's, really, it's really sad. We should be uh, uh, respecting and admiring what it takes you know, to repeat as champions and, uh, how, you know, how, recognize how hard that is. And, again, be inspired. Why envy somebody when we could be inspired by them? You know, we, we, right. we, could, we could push ourselves. You know, you don't know, have Michael Jordan's talent, but what if I had his will and his work ethic? You know, that's chosen. That, that's not innate. That's not hard way. That's something we choose, push ourselves hard, you know, to be the best we can be in whatever we love. And it, it sounds like, I mean, what you just said was really important when you talked about Jordan and in those years prior to the championships, right? And a lot of people forget that. And it, it's really interesting when we watch these, these athletes or others um, making their come up or they, you know, they haven't reached prime time yet and we root for them because, because of the, we're rooting for the underdog. And then, like you said, they get to that, to a certain level and then you hate them. And I just remember <laughs> a couple of weeks ago with uh, quest love, from you know he, he's from the music group the roots but he's on the the um what show late night show and um he had talked about that magic night not magic but for philly it was a magical night when when kobe was playing there and the whole stadium booed him because he's from from pennsylvania right <laughs> and that was like a sense of pride like we booed kobe <laughs> well did the, Eagle, did the eagles fans boo santa claus at one you know one time oh yeah one? yeah yeah <laughs> yeah it's, a, long time it's ago, a rough state man it's a rough state <laughs> well philadelphia is a tough town man there's no doubt about it you know yes yes uh, you did say one thing that I do want to uh, spend some time on uh, because, you know, when you're talking about Jordan uh, before he became a champion, uh, in that era, in the 80s, right, you had a, a player that would potentially stay with one team for most of his career. And now, you know, that's no longer the case in, in any of the sports. And when you're saying, well, they get paid a lot of money, I know when uh, people I know – or uh, we emulate them when we try to play the over-the-hill basketball league or what have you. But we also emulate them and maybe their agents because their agents are the ones that help negotiate those deals. And we're like, well, maybe I can negotiate that or something that I can learn from that and incorporate that in the business world. So are, are you seeing examples where people, obviously, uh, we, have, we could probably talk for hours about our love for the sport and acknowledging heroes, but are you seeing any transference in other walks of life? From um, the the use of agents, you mean, or or, uh, or just the hero like a, a free agency, and what does that mean? And you know, because for me, I, I know that I have a good relationship with the fire department here because every year except 2017, I always burn my Eagles jerseys because of <laughs> being upset with them. <laughs> 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 but I'm happy when they're able to negotiate a, a, a really good deal, and, and it could be a lot of money to us because we're not in that in that realm. But I can appreciate that from a business standpoint of wow, this person is really shrewd. Like th- some of my heroes are, are in the business world for that reason. Yeah, 
I, I, no, I, I think we, there's a good a good point on on, on how we can be inspired. Uh, again, there are, even even in sports, you know, there are always the haters. I mean, you know, I remember my dad you soured on they, they make too much money. Uh, well, well, you know, okay, he was a you know he's a teacher, you know, working hard to educate kids, uh, doing something really important. wasn't making much money, you know, as a teacher, and he was a good teacher. So I can understand, you know, he, he's he's making twenty thousand a year, and, and some baseball players making twenty million. I can understand, you know, being disgruntled uh, by that, but still, you know, I I mean. You're right. Some of these some of these athletes have been very very shrewd in in their merchandising, in the kinds of uh, you know pitch men. And Michael Jordan is like a you know a great example. I mean, he was I remember in the '90s, he was making vastly more money, you know, as a, working for Nike and uh, Gatorade and Hanes than he was for the Bulls. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, and I think again we could be you know learn from that and be inspired by it. So so I don't have his talent, his fame, his notoriety to leverage that into the kind of you know corporate deals that he made. But you, you know, there's like there was a one time athletes just made whatever money you know they made work, playing for their team, and they uh, you know maybe they made a little bit on the side doing something else, and then all these other they found all these other opportunities. Well, why can't I do the same? I mean, I don't have the fame that he has, but you know, how can I, how can I do that in my life? That's what I think heroes will, can do for us if we let them. You know, if we if we let ourselves be be inspired by them. I I, I mean, so I have a PhD in philosophy. Now, <laughs> believe me, there's not a lot. In, there's not as much interest in philosophy, Ham says, there is in basketball. I can assure you. That. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> Nevertheless. Maybe I can leverage that some way. You know, you know uh, I teach ethics all the time. Business ethics has become a big deal. Maybe I can contact some of the corporations and see if I can, you know, you know work for them or, or lecture for them, you know, on business ethics. And that's that's where you can make money. You know, make ten, twenty thousand dollars, you know, for for a, a few hours, you know, one morning. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, so there may be there may be some ways that I could leverage that in, in my own life. And I think that's why. One of one of several great things that heroes can do for us, but we have to be hero worshippers and, and hero emulators, not you know not en- envy ridden uh, people who you know, who who are just angry you know and hateful about other people being more successful than us. Yes, and, and I don't think he can dunk. I've never seen video of him dunking, but in his recent passing uh, over the holidays, it was brought to the world's attention that. David Stern is the big hero of the NBA before he was the commissioner of the NBA in the 80s. Uh, NBA was kind of like a second or third tier sport. Yeah. So when you were identifying what's a hero, you know, he had a degree of prowess, right? He faced severe obstacles. They're like, basketball players, we can't make any money off of these guys. And like you just said, in the 90s until now, you just see how you're, uh, he was able to at least lay out the foundation of – creating superstars uh, in the NBA. So maybe, you know, he's the man behind the man, and, and, and more people should highlight David Stern and people like him. Yeah, people who love basketball and love sports and who love, you know, what's the, the phrase, you know, thinking outside the box, coming up mm-hmm. with new ideas and, 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 and being creative. And, and David Stern really helped grow uh, the NBA and basketball as an international sport, and look at the, you know, look at how popular basketball is now uh, around the world. And if I remember correctly, David Stern has something to do with that. You know, marketing mm-hmm. the NBA ov- overseas, and it, it, it's re- it, the benefit is reciprocal. People overseas benefited enormously from you know realizing what a great sport this is, playing it, enjoying it, and so on. And and look at the NBA now with this influx of talent from you know mm-hmm. guys all guys all all over the world. I mean Luka Doncic, that's the dude's name. He's a tremendous offensive player. I don't know if he's ever going to be a great defender, but he's he's a tremendous offensive player. Where's he from? Croatia, I think. And 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 Joel Embiid, I know he played at Kansas and he was a great player, but someplace in Africa, isn't it? Where's, where's he from? Yeah, yeah, I believe so, but not yeah. specifically. I don't know where. 
Yeah. Yeah. And Elijah Warren, of course, was I think was you know back in the '90s. I think was from Nigeria. It's certainly somewhere on the African continent. But you know, there's this influx of tremendous talent into the NBA from oh, and then of course that big Chinese dude. What was his name? Yao, Yao Ming. Oh, Yao Ming. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, who's, that's probably a David Stern special in, in a way because I think David Stern. I could be wrong on this, but I, I think he helped you know promote uh, in the NBA and, and basketball in China. So, you know, there's a, yeah, there's a tremendous uh, uh, stature here in, in just having original thinking, seeing things that other people haven't seen yet and the potential for basketball to be grown. The NBA and basketball as a sport to be grown into an enormous international, international sport, and now it is. So let me get your take on, on since we're talking the international uh, scale and the international scene, in my opinion, that's why I want to get your opinion. In my opinion, the reason why 2021, or I believe it's 2021 or 2022, is when at college athletes can get paid off of their likeness, where years prior they could not. I think that the reason why the NCAA had to step up is because some high school athletes were, forgo- were encouraged to forego going to college for that one or two years and playing overseas, they would definitely get paid for that and they would have a better experience before they get into the NBA. So I want to get your take on what we may see as identifying heroes in the future on a global scale. Well, you know, as far as the the NCAA goes, I mean, I I think their their anti-professional attitude or anti-money-making attitude is – is antiquated. I, I, I mean, I want to make money. You know, I, I, I teach classes. I write books. I give lectures. I, I enjoy these processes. I reach out to the kids. I try and educate them as best I can. It's meaningful to me in and of itself. But I want to make money. I mean, I have to, my, I have to pay for my daughter's education. I have to, you know, pay the rent. I have to, you know, make the car payments and stuff. Making money is a good thing. If you work hard, and, and, and all these top athletes do, if you work hard, uh, you, then you're earning your money. And, and, you know, the idea that college players shouldn't have agents or shouldn't make money or anything, I, 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 think, it's, um, I think it's wrong. I, I mean, college, college kids... I mean, it's a cliche. A lot of people have worked their way through college. Oh, there's a guy, by the way, uh, who, who, who you know, came out of real poverty and worked his way through college was Sam Walton, you know, and the guy mm-hmm. who uh, founded Walmart. And I think he's a mm-hmm. hero because he gets a lot of abuse from a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, but I think the good vastly outweighs the bad, you know, at, at Walmart. But, uh, you know, people often work their way through college or, or work – to pay you know, at least partial uh, their their tuition and room and board, and I, and I think athletes could get paid just like somebody who's you know who's driving a truck, you know, uh, you know, working in a restaurant or, or or something. So I think the I think the NCAA is is wrong on that. I, I mean, this is capitalism. I, I mean, making money is good, and as long as you don't steal it, you know, you're working hard, you're earning mm-hmm. the money. It's a it's a good thing. So I, I'm I'm in favor of uh, all of this being done above board and getting and doing away with all the corruption that has you know, long existed in, in NCAA sports. And uh, yeah, I think it's be- that corruption happens because right there isn't that avenue. Yeah. And, uh, right. on- the other side of that, in, in the 90s, I, I was thinking about, uh, he's a sportscaster now, but the uh, Michigan, the the five or top five, I forgot what they were called, but, but the they fab, played the all five. played the Fab Five, and, you know, they wore the black socks and yeah, all that, yeah, and yeah. so he was talking all these years later how <laughs> they were seen as heroes, and everyone's dressing in black socks and baggy pants for the first time, but they didn't see a dime of it, you know, so it's like... Uh, what's the incentive to actually stay at the school uh, versus leaving when if you stayed there for the whole four years, you know, it could be a, a mutually beneficial relationship with you and the university. Yeah, absolutely. And th- this one and done policy in the, uh, sorry, you, guys, you probably hear the sirens in the, in the background here. It's a little a dog's bark. Is there a hero about to stop a crime out there? Is there... <laughs> yeah, I, know. I, hope, I hope nobody's house is burning down. That's the, you were talking about the, you being on good terms with the fire department before. That's the, <laughs> that's the local uh, fire department. But, I mean, the, the one-and-done policy is, you know, is, it's a shame because, 
great players come out of high school and they know they're only going to go to college one year and then they're going to go into the NBA. So then, you know, mm-hmm. it's great that they go into the NBA and that they're stars and that they make a lot of money. That's excellent. Their education, you know, might suffer. Whereas, like you were saying, if the, if the great athletes can make money when they were in college, you know, maybe there's less financial incentive to leave college so early and they could get a, a, a more complete education, which would certainly be mm-hmm. a good thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was thinking from, especially you being an educator, that, right, uh, there are so many that lead, they do that one and done, but when you mentioned Jordan or Kobe or some of these others, it's a finite amount of numbers of people that can play in the NBA. So they do that one and done, and then they're ineligible, and who knows what happened? Maybe they are working for Sam Walton afterward. So <laughs> there's a lot of heroes that we don't know about because it, it just doesn't seem that uh, they're encouraged to get stay there for four years. Yeah, yeah, they're not getting the education that they could get, which is an education is a good thing. We're human beings. We have a, a mind. I think it's, you know the mind is a terrible thing to waste. That's a beautiful and true slogan. Uh, so so um, that that's a sad point. Now you know on the other side, of course. Education is not limited to our schooling, right? Was that that mm-hmm. famous line attributed to Mark Twain, who I think you know finished fifth grade? I think was as far, as high as he went. But he said, "I I never let my schooling interfere with my education." Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's other ways to get an education. If somebody does one year, you know, at uh, North Carolina or whatever, and then you know goes to the NBA and and he's a reader, you know, and he you know that he could get an, he he could certainly get an education that way you know, just by having an active mind and thinking and, and reading. You don't need to go to college. I just, I want to mm-hmm. as a college professor, I want to you know uh, say that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Your colleagues better not listen to this podcast. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's right. But uh, yeah, I, I think the uh, you know these 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 great college players. Uh, oh no, that's what I wanted to say. You're talking about um, the heroes who we never heard of. The really, um, I think the really sad, the saddest example I think is you know is people with, who, who have wasted potential. You know, and you see this in, uh, in, in, in any different areas. I see it, you know, as a, as a college professor with students whom I, I, I remember one kid, I won't mention his name, I still remember him all these years later. Uh, you know, he's super smart. I mean, his IQ may have, may have tested off the scale as far as I know. But he was a serious drug abuser. And mm-hmm. when I don't want to see anybody kill themselves, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, mm-hmm. coke. I'm not talking about, you know, pharmaceuticals. I, so I don't want to see anybody kill themselves on drugs, you know, much less somebody with this kind of talent. And I called him one. I remember he washed off to me. I'll never forget what he said. He said to me, Dr. Bernstein, he said, drugs are our friends, you know, unquote. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, you know, cocaine is never going to be your friend, not in any form. It could kill you, you know. So, mm-hmm. so the people who, who in one form or another have tremendous potential – and they, for one reason or another, they squander it. And, and, and since we're talking mm-hmm. basketball, homes, there's all these city legends, you know, these, these urban legends. Yes. Guys, like yes. Earl Manigault and, 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 and the, what was his name, the Destroyer? Uh, Joe, Joe something. Um, they called him the Destroyer. Uh, mm. uh, you know, he was, um, his name... His name will come to me, but he was in the Rucker tournament, you know, in uh, in New York City. <laughs> he missed. He, he was a drug dealer. He missed the f- mm-hmm. the first half. He was playing against you know the team that had Julius Irving and Charlie Scott on it. And they say in the second half he came in second half scored fifty points in the second half in overtime again against Julius, wow. Irving, Julius Irving and Charlie Scott. You know, one NBA Hall of Famer, one you know in, in, NBA star. Uh, yeah. Joe the, Joe the Destroyer Hammond, that was his name, Joe Hammond, if anybody wants to mm-hmm. Google it. But, you know, and, but he, the Lakers offered him a deal, I think, in like, you know, circa 1970, for like, I don't mm-hmm. know, $50,000. And he turned it down because he said he made more money dealing drugs. But, right. uh, but you know, the drug, the drug kingpin egg ended up, you know, getting busted, you know, doing time in the joint. And uh, between mm-hmm. his drug use and his incarceration, his, his, his talents were just, a traded away, and, I, and the, mm-hmm. the great player he could have been is just, you know, saddest words in the language, right? What could have been? And so, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, all, all these people could have been heroes in, in, any, in any different field, but there's the point about heroes. It's not enough to be talented. It's not enough to be a genius or a super athlete or something. You've got to be willing to work to develop it. 
And that's, that's what separates, you know, the people who do from the people who don't. It's all about the will to excel. Now, we're, now we're talking overall about heroes and what have you. What happens when, you know, the people that we highlighted, hopefully they don't fall into this category, but there comes a time in every sport, baseball in the early 2000s or boxing in the 50s and 60s, you know, your heroes, you come to find out that, you know, they threw the fight or they were shaving, point shaving. And so what happens when a hero's name and image and likeness is tarnished? Wow. Well, yeah, I mean, baseball is, is right in the crosshairs right now with the uh, Astros. Uh, the Astros, cheating, yeah. Yeah, the cheating scandal. Some great players. I mean, I, I mean, there's some, you know, some great players on that team. The, 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 there's uh, uh, Jose Altuve and, and uh, Alex Bregman and George Springer. These guys really need to cheat to be you know, great players. I, I mean, I doubt it. But, yeah, now, they're, now they're, their numbers – you know, uh, Altuve was the American League MVP a few years ago, and they were, you know, that's when the year, the year was 2017, the year they were certified as cheating. Uh, now the whole accomplishment and their championship is all thrown into doubt. There's people, players in MLB, you know, who want to see the Astros title vacated, who want to see Altuve's MVP award, you know, taken away. It's all tainted now, you know, and, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, my mom taught my sisters and I when, when we were little kids, you know, cheaters only cheat themselves. And in the mm-hmm. end, you know, like Lincoln said, you can't fool all the people all the time. How did they think they were going to get busted? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in the end, and all the, and all the steroid guys in baseball, too, you know, who, who were already Hall of Fame level, you know, Roger Clemens, Barry Bonds, you know, guys like that, those guys were going to Cooperstown. And then you know, right. Alex Rodriguez, you know, and, and, and then they they possibly threw it all away. Their record is tarnished. You know, it's, uh, mm-hmm. it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame. Uh, and they get vilified. In this case, they, they, they deserve it. They earned it. They, they, they cheated. You know? And, and uh, it's sad because, you know, I would say if, if you, you, you're so great as it is, go out there and, and, and compete just with your natural talent and, and, and your will to win. You, you don't need to cheat to be great. And furthermore, your moral character for any of us, no matter what our talent level is or what our profession is, our moral character has to be the most precious thing about us. It's, it's more important than winning the World Series. Winning the World, winning the World Series is great. Or winning the NBA title is great. But, you know, if you have to cheat to do it, I mean, is, is, is like, uh, you know, having a great sex life is great, but if you have to cheat on your wife to do it, it's not worth it. You know, mm-hmm. you're, 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 you're hurting her, the woman you love. You're, you're harming your relationship, and, and above all, you're undermining your moral character, which I think is, mm-hmm. should be our greatest source of pride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the mirror. If you can't, uh, I always heard, if you can't look in the mirror or you can't sleep with yourself at night, then it's not worth it. Exactly. That, yeah, that's, yeah that's, that's, that, that, there's wisdom there. Mm-hmm. I, I do want to ask you, because at the top we were talking about Kobe, and one thing that I, I think really strikes, at least for me, is, or two things. One, like you were saying, you don't necessarily have to go to college. You know, he, I mean, even though he was uh, college ready and very intelligent, he, if he had gone to college, he would never would have been able to play against Jordan. And so that was one of his goals. So that's, I think that was admirable. And then the big picture is he retired a couple of years ago and had a lot of balls uh, juggling, pun intended, for all these other uh, other ventures outside of outside of basketball. So, what do you say about like you were saying? If I won the Super Bowl, but I won the Super Bowl in 1983, and I haven't done anything since, how do you keep that hero mystique going? Yeah, that's that's um, that's really important because you know, for the most part, as as athletes. You know, the career ends at a relatively young age, and 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 and, and some of these guys and the rest of their lives are kind of sad. You know, it's like the best years of our lives were in our twenties, and it's all it's like all downhill after that. It reminds you, you know, uh, that Bruce Springsteen song, those glory days. You know, mm-hmm. when he's talking about you know, the, you know this guy's you know in high school, this guy was a great pitch. He could throw that old speed ball by you, and now he's you know he's, I don't I don't know what he's doing now, but his his best years were. You know, as a high school baseball player, it's sad, um, and so it's it's great to see guys like Kobe who have a, a second career 
you know, a- after was, and they, they, they say that, uh, you know, Kobe was so wrapped up in, in, be, in being a dad with his kids and the other activities that, that he did, that, that he, he had a very fulfilled life that he, he, he you mm-hmm. know, and people like Michael Jordan and Derek Jeter, you know, made all, made enough money and they know the game well enough that they could become an owner, you know, and they, and they, and Jeter did a good job. I mean, he held off. He always said he was going to hold off on marriage and family until his playing career was over. And after he, after he retired, he got married. I think they I think they have two. I think they have two kids now. And so you know, mm-hmm. some of these guys have done it well. You know, they've planned out their lives well so that there's there's a life after the playing career ends. But it's sad for the guys who who just haven't put the forethought in. You know, to well, what's what's my life going to be like a- afterwards? And, and you know, let me pick. Let me let me mention one name that probably nobody remembers anymore, but I think yeah. is really good in this uh, context. And that was a dude named Mike Reed. You might remember. He's from Pennsylvania, dude. You know, Penn State. Uh, it goes long, back a long way, 1970s, I think. He was All-America mm-hmm. defensive lineman at Penn State, and then he was uh, all-pro defensive lineman for the Cincinnati Bengals. And he retired when he was like 28 because he wanted to be a composer. He was a pianist. He uh. didn't comp- he didn't accomplish, you know, uh, Reed is R-E-I-D for anybody who wants to Google, Google him, Mike Reed. Yeah. He'd been a pianist, you know, and a very accomplished one, and he, he left the NFL and, you know, a lot of money and a Hall of Fame career because he was a perennial all-pro, as I recall, and uh, had a career as a, as a composer. He wrote a whole bunch of country songs that were big hits. I think he branched out into, into other uh, in writing uh, Broadway musical, you know, Broadway shows and, and opera and stuff. He's had a he's had a tr- tremendous career. I think he's in his seventies now. So you know, something like that can be a real a real role model. It's like not mm-hmm. that you, not that you want to retire from professional sports at twenty eight, whatever it was, but you 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 have uh, other loves in your life that when your career is over, whenever it is, you you can you kind of move into uh, other other areas that you love. Like Kobe Bryant was ready was ready to do that. Derek Jeter did it. Michael Jordan did it. You know, and and Mike Reed did it. You know, there's uh, uh, the, the forethought. You know, <laughs> that's very heroic. You know, it's not just live in the moment. You know, we want to enjoy the moment, but we want to plan for the future too. You know, and uh, some some of these guys don't do it. Their career's over, and 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 that's like the high point of their life. And then they they end the career's over at 35. And what they do for the next 40 or 50 years, and it's not they don't find anything that's meaningful you know it's sad so you're help, you're helping me redefine definitions and maybe you could clarify for me but it sounds like we're making a distinction between heroes and legends it seems like the the latter with the jeter jordan uh reed or Co- or bryant would fit fall into the legend status and I think that's where I was going from at the beginning of the podcast where I was talking about some infamous people, what well, they started out where they could have been heroes, but ultimately they never made heroes and they definitely didn't make legendary status, whereas some of these others, it seems like uh, we could refine it. Is there a difference between a hero and a legend? Well, you know, again, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I, I mean, to, to, like, to like become a legend, remember they used to call – Bird, they used to call him Larry Legend. Uh, yes, and uh, and yeah, those those are great battles back in the '80s with the Lakers and the Celtics. That was good stuff. But um, yeah, yeah to, 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 I think to reach legend status, it, to me, it's almost like, it's almost like you you go beyond you go beyond heroism. It's you 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 you, you become a hero. Even to other heroes, you're like a man amongst men. You're a hero amongst heroes. It's like you're in the upper echelon. You know, it's like you're not, you're not just in the Hall of Fame. There's a lot of guys in the Baseball Hall of Fame, but you are, you know, you're Babe Ruth or you're Lou Gehrig or you're Willie Mays or you're, you know, you're like the you're like the upper uh, you know, the upper elite. So I, I, you know, I think to, to me, a guy who's a legend or should be a legend would be Jackie Robinson because it's, it's mm-hmm. not just what he accomplished as a baseball player, which was like his third or fourth best sport, by the way. <laughs> you know, he's a legitimate Hall of Fame. But what he overcame, my God, a, 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 a <laughs> real, real persecution. I mean, guys deliberately you know, hitting him in the head, you know, with a 95-mile-an-hour mm-hmm. fastball. I mean, you could kill somebody throwing a hardball, mm-hmm. you know. And, I mean, and, and, and he overcame all of that. And it's, 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 mm-hmm. it's that, you know, he's... Uh, he's he's a legend, I think, and you know, undeservedly so. Oh, absolutely, and I guess we'd be remiss 
if we didn't include uh, Mr. Ali in that, so I think I would put him into that legendary stat, Muhammad Ali. Oh, oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, I mean he he's he's not just probably the greatest. I guess it's always debatable who's the greatest boxer, you know, pound for pound, the greatest heavyweight of all time, maybe the greatest boxer of all time, pound for pound. Uh, it's, 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 it's it's that, but also. All the uh, you know all the other things in in his life the the conscientious objections that of being stripped of his title, you know, and then coming back from that with those great fights against Joe Frazier and the great fights against George Foreman, uh, the rope and dope <laughs> the rope and dope <laughs> fight in, in Zaire, where I mean Foreman was a great fighter, a lot of and and, and, a, and a very patriotic American, and I had a lot of respect for George Foreman. But he had Ali had had George Foreman talking about voodoo, you know, after that fight, you know, and he couldn't. He didn't, <laughs> he, I mean. <laughs> it was just it was just a, a brilliant ring generalship on the part of Ali with that rope dope strategy because George Foreman just seemed absolutely invincible, and uh, right. yeah, hell yeah, yeah, Muhammad Ali is definitely a legend. Well, it, it, and for our audience, you know, they're they're a little older, and I'm sure they were just grooving along with us, and. For the younger, they're probably like, well, what about the new guys? What about the fight over this weekend with Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder? Do these guys, is it still too early to call these guys heroes? Can they, do they have what it takes to make legendary status? What do you think of, of the, these new guys that are out there? Yeah, well, it's interesting. Adversity, you know, heroes come up in the face of adversity. I, I mean, Winston Churchill was, was a, like a loser, you know, prior to World War II. And then, you know, Hitler comes to power and he's, you know, and he's, and he's voted, uh, Churchill's voted into prime minister and he comes into his own, you know, in the cauldron of World War II. So Dante Wilder has adversity now. You know, he's just be, he's this, he's this hard-hitting guy. I, I thought he was going to knock Fury out. You know, that right hand of his is just dynamite. But, you know, he got outboxed, outfought, uh, uh, lost by TKO. Now he's got adversity, and now we got a chance to see what Wilder's made out of internally. We know mm -hmm. he can hit. There's no question about mm -hmm. that. Now can he, can he, can he come back? Uh, can he come back and maybe even, you know, redefine his game? Can he, can he, because he's, he's like a, He's a, he's a right-hand knockout artist. Can he expand his game? You know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, but Tyson Fury, he's an interesting guy you know, because what is he was like 6'9", about 270 pounds. And he can box. Giant. This dude's got some yeah. skills. You know? Yeah. He, he, you know, you know uh, and I don't want to sound like a racist here, but you know, big white guys like that, they're usually you know, they're kind of slow and ponderous and everything. And Tyson Fury's got some game. I mean, he's, he, he's, he can box. And he's already mm -hmm. overcome stuff. Didn't he? Didn't he? Didn't he overcome alcoholism and? Uh, I think so. Yeah, yeah and I various so. type of depression. And he's a character too. He's he's good. For, I think he's good for the game for boxing. I mean, you know, he's singing. You know, he's singing. And he's not a bad singer. He's singing. You know, in the ring after the fight, and he's just goofy. <laughs> you know, he's colorful. <laughs> he's a colorful, goofy guy. He's the Gypsy King, and I think mm. you know, we'll see what if Fury can Fury sustain it. You know, he's thirty-one. He's on the cusp, right? I mean, can he sustain it? Can he can he have three, four more years of, of you know consistent title defenses and be a and be a, a, a champ for three, four, five years? Then I think if he if he does, you know, we don't just have, have complete turnover, you know, as the heavyweight champ. Then I think Fury, you know, achieves heroic status because it's hard enough to become the champ, but to stay the champ, everybody's gunning for you as it should be. They should be mm -hmm. you have the bullseye on your on your chest and your back. You should, and then you have to overcome mm -hmm. that. You know, and uh, he's an interesting guy. I hope he does well because he's just he's good for the game. He's just a breath of fresh air. He's just a colorful, goofy dude. You know, the Gypsy King. And he's he's, uh, he's very eccentric, <laughs> and yeah, I, I, and, and he's uh, he's got some skills. He's not just a big he's not just a big lumbering dude. You know, right, right. So, I mean, it seems like we, I mean, we've covered the gamut as far as heroes. I think I have a better understanding. I think I have a better understanding of legends as well, and it's fitting because your book is Heroes, Legends, Champions, Why Heroism Matters. So where could people pick that up? Where could they uh, get more information about you, website, social media, and all that good stuff? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. So, well, the, the Heroes, Legends, Champions – why heroism matters. I mean, best place to get is Amazon. Amazon sells all books, which is a great thing about Amazon. Why I think Jeff Bezos is a hero. You know, for mm -hmm. whatever bad things he he does, he's, he, his I think the good vastly outweighs the bad. But Heroes, Legends, Champions, you can get it from Amazon. Uh, my website is you know AndrewBernstein.net. 
you know, A-N-D-R-E-W-B-E-R-N-S-T-E-I-N.net. And, of course, you know, uh, Facebook, if they want uh, I think I think I have 5,000 personal on my personal account, but my business um, – you know, my business page, they, and I do a lot of, I, I have a Facebook live show, you know, for the, for the, the Brooklyn kid, you know, and I, you know, and I talk about heroism, and I talk about the educational system and stuff, so they can like my uh, business page on, on, on Facebook and, and, and um, uh, tune into the Brooklyn kid on Facebook live. So, yeah, my, my website is andrewbernstein.net. You get Heroes, Legends, Champions from Amazon, and, uh, and that would be great. Phenomenal, man. Well, you've just been in tune to another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza and Dr. Andrew Bernstein. It was a pleasure speaking with you, man. Let's stay in touch. Same, same here, Hamza. You know, this, this was fun. So if you want to do it again, I'm certainly up for it. Absolutely, man. Take care. You too. You too, Hamza. Bye. Cheers. Hello?